welcome to SAM Conversation, a program of South Asia Monitor. It is our pleasure to welcome Commodore Uday Bhaskar, looking at 25 years of the Kargil conflict, loosely referred to as the Kargil War. It was in the Kargil War. I say that this is the fourth India-Pakistan war continuing since the late 1970s, 70s, 80s, late, late 1970s and continuing where Kargil was an intensification from May till July 1999. We were, I think, only about at least eight months late in reacting to the war when we did in May 1999. Preparation for this Pakistan Army's misadventure, whatever, in Kargil was uh, easily maybe a year older because they raised 12 battalions of the Northern Light Infantry specifically for Kargil. And on the when uh, India was celebrating 50 years of independence and the armed forces were looking at 50 years of uh, their existences, you know, the armed Army, Navy, Air Force of Independent India. In August 1997, Pakistan Army bombarded the... Uh, they made the attempt to try and cut off Kargil. And uh, there was... Uh, there was there, so there was some... Uh, traffic which uh, uh, moving on it which was uh, you know targeted which got targeted and uh, it got reported by the uh, Pakistani the Kashmir media in Kashmir then there was diary of a lieutenant Mazullah Khan Sumbal which was which came into the hands of Indian army personnel and which the army headquarters uh, made copies of and a lot of us got got hold of uh, that this here's an officer of the Pakistan army who was deputed to one of the battalions of the Northern Light Infantry and reported there in uh, December 1998. And the Northern Light Infantry was raised. I don't think there's any doubt that it was raised as cannon fodder. It was a largely non-Sunni force of eight major groups, Baltis, Shins, Yashkuns, Mughals, Kashmiris, Pathans, Ladakhis and Turks. 49% Shias, 23% Ismailis. 10% Noor Bakshis, only 18% were Sunni. 55% of these were from the Gilgit region. 35% of them were from the Baltistan region. And they were launched to try to capture Kargil, Dras, and Batalik. And when the Indian Army reacted in May, this force was well deployed in Sangars or, you know, fortifications. Bunkers, the heights, the very, very steep, and the Indian Army paid a very dear price by way of fatal casualties in the bravest of actions by uh, Indian, Indian uh, you know, Army soldiers and junior leaders. Bravest of actions, uh, as I mean, that's that's nothing new. And then uh, this, this, what, what do you, what do you call it? It's, it's an intelligence failure, and it's also maybe. A little bit of shutting of the eyes by the brass to, to certain developments on the ground. But then we, do we learn about nine, 21 years later, uh, 2020 at Galwan, uh, there's a, a reputation by the, uh, uh, you know, this time by the Chinese. And then 25 years later now, we are, for the past month in Jammu and Kashmir, we are seeing an unprecedented uh, unprecedented uh, renewal of uh, terrorism where um, almost back to back we've had about 20 inc incidents in uh, that many days. Commander Uday Bhaskar um, has commented a lot. I've, I've heard him. Um, I look forward to share his thoughts. Please. Thank you, Anil, first of all, for inviting me to have this conversation with you. And you have given a very detailed background to the genesis of Kargil and where we are 25 years later. And if we were to reflect on the lessons learned and the issues that we should be focusing on, I think what stands out, and you have made reference to that particular aspect, is the sheer valor and gallantry of the Indian Forge, particularly those who were in the ground zero, which was at heights in the Himalayan peaks that were completely unprecedented. We are talking of peaks that are between 13,000, 14,000 and going all the way up to perhaps even 16,000 feet. 
and to conduct those operations with the kind of information, material resources, and preparation that they had was a very daunting task. When it began, it seemed near impossible. And that, I think, is the unparalleled valor and gallantry of the Indian soldier that they were able to retrieve the situation for India. Because if the Pakistani plan had succeeded, the one which had been secretly planned by General Musharraf, perhaps even from the time when he was a DGMO, from what you have recounted, I think this is the shining feature of the Kargil War that 25 years later, we should pay tribute and acknowledge the supreme sacrifice made by 527 brave hearts. And let us also not forget the more than 1,000 who were grievously injured and even today bear the scars of that war. And of course, the families who lost their loved ones. If you can think of the young soldier, the young officer, who would have perhaps been raising their families, those children would have little memory perhaps of their fathers. And today they would be in their late twenties, if not early thirties. And I think it is to those that our hearts go out at this point in time, because you know this is one of those cruel aspects of any war, that on occasions like this, the families are remembered, those who are wounded are remembered, but very soon they are forgotten. So I think it's very important to underline this human aspect and salute the brave hearts and offer solace to the families. That having been said, I think we should also look at the systemic or institutional lessons that should be drawn. And here again, I'm picking up from two of the points that you made. The first, of course, is the intelligence lapse, as it is being referred to. Now, over the years, I think every year, you and I have both been students of that war, going back to our days in the IDSA and subsequently in other fora. And every year, my own reading is that we get to know a little more about the war because of some disclosure, some personal account, something that has appeared perhaps in the international media and so on and so on, journals and so on. So the distillation of all of this is that, yes, there was indeed an intelligence lapse. And how and where this lapse happened, I think is something that we need to look at objectively. You will recall that General Nirmal Witch, the former army chief, who was the director general military operations during the Kargil war, had authored a book alone in the ring. The media had carried some excerpts of that book. And one of them, the excerpts that I saw, I think all of us have seen, spoke about the RNAW, <coughs> a research and analysis wing, and that they were not able to provide whatever inputs the army could have acted on is what General Beach has said. Now, this that book is currently on hold. The government has apparently said it has to be wetted before release. So, which means that we do not even now, 25 years later, first of all, have an official version of that war. It's not being published. I gather it's still being vetted or it's the final stage. And the second is somebody like the DGMO who would have had the overall 360 degree perspective sitting in Delhi of that war. His account is also not available to us. So I think this is unfortunate. But it does point to what I would call as not taking ownership of the lapses, meaning, if you remember, the reason why I'm making this observation is that when the Kargil war happened, soon after July 26, Kargil devastated when the war formally ended. Then Prime Minister Vajpayee, who incidentally was a caretaker Prime Minister, had what I would call as the courage and the integrity to set up a review committee to look into why Kargil had happened because Kargil was a fiasco. It caught the Indian entire security apparatus, the armed forces, the intelligence agencies, and everyone who contributes to the management of national security were caught napping. I mean, that is my rather stark 
reduction of what happened. And again, you were right when you pointed out that this happened in October 1962 when the Chinese, quote unquote, surprised India. It happened in Kargit in the summer of 1999. It happened in 2008 when Mumbai was attacked by a terror group. And alas, I think to our shame, in 2020 in Galwan, we were talking about the Indian units being surprised. So there is a systemic issue here. And Prime Minister Vajpayee, when he set up the task force, had encouraged them to look at the issues that led to Kargil War or the lapses that led to the Kargil War. And in that particular Kargil Review Committee report, yes, intelligence lapses were identified. And I think there is some detail about how the army had perhaps not done its own due diligence based on all the inputs it has received. And again, most recent revelations are that of a major during the Kargil War, if I remember right, he was five para, has filed a case in the court in which he has charged General Ved Malik, the army chief at that time, on the intelligence lapse issue. Now, we are analysts. And if we look back, I would say that one of the lessons that needs to be learned and which has not been learned is setting right the intelligence inadequacy. And I want to add here that Prime Minister Vajpayee did something unprecedented, which is that the Kargil Review Committee was commissioned in the end of July, within days of the war ending. And Mr. K. Subramanian, you'll remember, former director of the IDSA, illustrious security doyen of India. He was the chairman of the committee. We had Lieutenant General Hazari, the former vice chief of the army, Mr. George Varghis, the celebrated journalist, and Mr. Satish Chandra, the diplomat, who was, if I remember right, was the deputy national security advisor at that time. They completed this report in record time. If you look at the published version on December 15th, you have the four members signing that particular report and submitting it. And to his credit, Mr. Rajesh Mishra, the National Security Advisor to Prime Minister Vajpayee, allowed most of the report to be placed in the public domain in the form of a book. And furthermore, and this I think is a very interesting part that has perhaps not received adequate notice, within months, by the time we come to early 2000s, Prime Minister Vajpayee sets up a group of ministers. If you remember, the Cabinet Committee on Security at that time was Prime Minister Vajpayee, Defence Minister George Fernandes, Finance Minister Jaswan Singh, and External Affairs Minister Yashwan Sinha, eminent Cabinet Ministers who were part of Mr. Vajpayee's CCS. The group of ministers was constituted, if I remember right, in April, and they were <clears throat> in turn asked to make recommendations about how do we implement and ensure that the system is corrected for policy and systemic and structural changes. And again, to their credit, we must doff our hat. The group of ministers deliberated and decided to set up four task forces. Again, I'm repeating what perhaps you know very well, and many of the others who have been following this more closely. Four task forces were set up. One, to look at the rewiring of higher defense management of the country. The second was intelligence. The third was border management, because there was an acknowledgement that India's borders need to be reviewed holistically. And finally, internal security, because Kargil was also part of the proxy war, the one that you referred to, and impacting India's internal security. These four task forces were set up, again, if I remember right, in April. And they were given three months to four months to complete their work. And look at the people who were appointed to head these task forces. Crossing the political divide, Mr. Vajpayee as Prime Minister invites Mr. Arun Singh, who, if you remember, was a former Minister of Defense in the Rajiv Gandhi cabinet. He is invited to head the defense reforms, defense management task force. And the other three chairs, if I remember right, are Mr. Madhav Godbole, a very eminent civil servant, a home secretary. Mr. Mm -hmm. N.N. Vora, yes. another civil servant, home secretary, defense secretary, man of enormous experience. And the last task force 
was Mr. Gary Saxena. GC Saxena was a former DG DSF, a very illustrious IPS officer. And all these task forces submitted their reports. You have a GOM task force uh, report, Group of Ministers report. It's again in the public domain, in a redacted form. And we had a blueprint to proceed on all four tracks. And this to me is the biggest lesson which was not learned after the end of the Kargil War, that none of the recommendations that were identified were reviewed, deliberated upon, and taken to their logical conclusion. As an analyst, I say with regret, India as a nation, the government of India, whoever be the prime minister, has not been able to take forward a very important task initiated by Prime Minister Vajpayee. That, I'm sorry, I took so long, but I thought I should place this in context. On the nail, um, on many, many issues, um, what, uh, what uh, you know, what, what is further lamentable is that it's, it's not that we lack uh, technology today, but it seems that, now take, for instance, the, uh, uh, um, the IIB, the research and analysis wing, and the, even the uh, army intelligence, they, they, seem, they, they, they still seem to be you know, on their separate turfs. They don't seem to be uh, converging at times when it's, when it's so vital to do so. And there, there, I, I feel that there have, there have been instances where they've been sitting on, on gold mines of information. No, no, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, I think let me add here that if you look back from Mr. Vajpayee's tenure as Prime Minister to where we are now with Prime Minister Modi in the chair, to his credit, the Modi government in the last five years, you know, in the tenure from 2019 to 24, took a radical decision to perhaps take the first step, which is when they looked at the need to rewire the higher defense management and the first CDS for India, General Bipin Rawat was appointed. And I think we all applauded at that time saying that perhaps this is the beginning of, you know, the major structural reforms. But when I look back, I would say it was an important step. And the CDS was also given the status within the Ministry of Defense as the Secretary of the DMA, the Department of Military Affairs. And there was talk about setting up the theater commands. But from then to now, I repeat this point, it's been very uneven. And yes, it's a tragedy that General Rawat, you know, died in that helicopter crash. And subsequently, as I said, I only at this stage say that at least there has been some progress in trying to do the defense reforms within the military, which is CDS and theatrization, and perhaps the other steps will follow. But I think the biggest lapse has been intelligence, as you have pointed out, which is that Despite the fact that intelligence lapses have bedeviled the Indian system from October 1962 to Galwan, perhaps you know one can say that even more recently what has been happening in Jammu is a case of a different kind of intelligence inadequacy that we've had so many challenges. And this is where I think the government of the day has been very hesitant, very reticent to embark on the intelligence reforms that India needs so urgently. And I think even now, if you look at the verticals, which is the RNAW, the Research and Analysis Wing, the IB, the Intelligence Bureau, and all the others that have been created, for instance, within the armed forces, we have the three Army, Navy, Air Force Intelligence, the DIA, which is part of the IDS headquarters. So they're all different verticals. Their integration and whatever had been recommended is still on hold. And I think the biggest, again, I say this, uh, I'm trying to say this as objectively as I can, that there seems to be a resistance to reform. And this, again, is perhaps, you know, inexplicable at one level, because in the last 20 years, we have had two very highly rated officers from the IPS in the chair of the National Security Advisor, Mr. M.K. Narayanan, if you remember, a former DIB, director of the IB, the Intelligence Bureau, yes. was the NSA to Dr. Manmohan Singh. Now we have Mr. Ajit Dover, who is very well regarded in his own domain. He has been NSA for 10 years. Yet, there has been no attempt 
because my personal view, and I think many others share this, we need a more, you know, we need sunshine. We need to illuminate what is happening in the intelligence sector, like in any democracy. Bring in a parliamentary kind of committee if you want to, to review and yep. get lateral talent. Lateral talent is not coming in. So I think the IPS, Me. so I mean, I said that reform is very urgent, very critical, and that has not happened. Perhaps in the interest of time, we cannot go elsewhere. But if you were to ask me as concluding thoughts, the one single issue, which I think the Cargill war has in a way highlighted is the need for intelligence reforms. And that has not happened. And both the parliamentary oversight and the need for lateral induction and the use of technology, which you have also noted, yes, are I yes, think yes. critical elements. Hopefully, Modi 3.0 would be able to look at this in a focused way. Udhav Asher, you, you've thrown light on so many issues. Uh, in fact, I'm, the, the, we, we're a little strapped for time. Um, otherwise, there's, there's so much more that we can... Uh, uh, I, know, I know I've heard you uh, speak on other um, networks and uh, programs, uh, and there's so much one, one um, you know, has um, in one's own uh, uh, records and writings. Um, we, we, all we can do is hope and pray that this, there's, there's a tremendous amount of talent. And it should be the, we, we've proved, uh, we've, you know, we've, we've done uh, these, the, the surgical strikes. These were a series of very, very, very well coordinated special operations over a distance of 250 kilometers, nine locations which were dealt with in the middle of the night. Hats off. Uh, Balakot, again, an excellent uh, example of, uh, you know, an Air Force operation of uh, pinpoint. Uh, but you can't just use these as technology demonstrators. If these are repeated, uh, I, I, I think you'll agree, sir, that uh, they, I think, the terrorism that is uh, being uh, uh, supported, directed, and produced from Pakistan may actually get, you know, it may start hurting them, hurting Pakistan army. If, if we react each time to each to each attack, as we have the capability of, capability of doing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Come to um, Thank you, Anil. Look forward for some more in the future. Yeah, All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.